peut-être pour l'envoi. OK. On va dans la tête. Yeah, yeah. Good evening uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to one of the most interesting panels organized during this IGF workshop. For those who attended this morning workshop uh, in room 11, <coughs> I would like to say that uh, uh, some of the issues were similar, but uh, as the challenges are so huge, it's always good to have different views in addressing this issue of violent extremism and radicalization of young people by using new technologies. As you may know, this uh, was initiated, the work of UNESCO in this area was initiated in June 2015 by the first ever conference on the challenges of internet and the youth radicalization leading to violence. So we are extremely uh, proud to have here with us the outgoing chair of the Intergovernmental Council for the Information for All program, Madam Shafika Adat, who was chairing the program at that time and uh, who helped this uh, program to be crafted first at the level of the CI sector, then at UNESCO, and consequently the Secretary General at that time, Ban Ki-moon, took it from UNESCO as an idea and made uh, his own plan of action uh, about which you all know ad adopted in January 2016. So since that time, a lot of uh, similar activities happened around the world. And uh, today, more than ever, we can uh, express some satisfaction by the fact that uh, fortunately enough, our activities produced the expected results. Uh, there is uh, much less opportunities for propaganda uh, on the social media, although, you know, at the beginning it was not so obvious since the big companies were quite reluctant in applying uh, the remedies that we were promoting. Twitter, I must say, was uh, the most active in playing the game uh, by closing over three years, more than uh, 450,000 Twitter accounts spreading propaganda of hatred, violence, and extremism all around. So today we are here to discuss what else we have to do because uh, this is a endless work, endless effort. I like to quote uh, uh, one of the French uh, big thinkers who said that in uh, democracy, every generation is a new people. That means that every generation, every year, we have to explain, we have to uh, make sure that uh, the same messages are passed, that we are mobilizing the synergies, that we are having the researchers continuing their work, that we are finding new ways because the technology is evolving, and by evolving we have to adapt. So it's an extremely challenging issue. It's an extremely challenging work and uh, uh, we are thankful for you being here today because uh, that shows the interest and I'm very glad to see a lot of young people also attending. So with these few remarks, I would like now to invite Madam Shafika Adat, who is the Deputy Permanent Delegate of Grenada to UNESCO. She has played key roles in UNESCO's international standard setting activities and in chairing or serving in various intergovernmental forums and commissions. Prior to her diplomatic career, she was the director of the Center for Action and Information for Development and International Understanding and the vice chair of the World Federation of UNESCO Clubs, Centers and Associations. Madam Adat, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, UNESCO is playing a key role toward peaceful, just, and inclusive societies which are, which are free from fear and violence. 
as the Agenda 2030 mentions, there can be no sustainable development without peace and no peace without sustainable development. In the framework of the organization's mandate, UNESCO is empowering young women and men to live up to their potential as positive change actors through unique cross-sectoral work on education as a tool to prevent violent extremism, youth participation and empowerment, media and online coalitions for the prevention of violent extremism and celebrating cultural diversity. On behalf of the chair of the Information for All program, IFAP, Mrs. Dorothy Gordon, representative of Ghana, I'm happy to provide you with details on UNESCO's role and follow up in addressing the issue of preventing use from online radicalization leading to violent extremism. She wanted to be with us today, but had another engagement and requested me to convey a message from her. I quote, it is important to give young people the tools that will allow them to resist those who attempt to manipulate them using grooming techniques linked to social media and other digital means. It is impossible to overemphasize the need for all nations to actively promote media information literacy and the ethics of online discourse. End of quote. The UN's global counterterrorism strategy, adopted in 2006 by the General Assembly, encouraged UNESCO to play a key role concerning measures to address the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. When focusing on media and online coalitions for the prevention of violent extremism, it is important to remember that preventing violent extremism is a commitment and obligation under the principles and values enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights instruments. In 2013, the UNESCO General Conference passed a resolution on internet and issues which encouraged international and interdisciplinary reflection and debate on the ethical challenges of emergence, emerging technologies. IFAP was established in 2001 to provide a platform for international policy discussions capacity building, cooperation, and the development of national policy framework and guidelines for actions in the area of access to information and knowledge. IFAP was created by UNESCO to respond to the challenges of the knowledge societies. Through its intervention across its strategic priority areas, IFAP is contributing to the creation of inclusive knowledge societies. In March 2015, as mentioned earlier, UNESCO organized the conference. No, it was not mentioned, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, organized the, uh, a conference connecting the dots that led to the, this decision 56 of the general conference entitled Connecting the Dots Option for Future Action, UNESCO's role in internet-related issues, which endorsed a range of options, including a call for human rights-based ethical reflection, research, and public dialogue on the implication of new and emerging technologies and their potential societal impact. UNESCO also organized in June 2015, in the framework of IFAP, the first ever international conference on youth and the internet fighting radicalization and extremism. The conference called for a greater media and information literacy and for a holistic response to youth radicalization based on knowledge and, a respe and the respect of human rights. This was followed in 2016 by the International Conference, Internet and the Radicalization of Youth, Preventing, Acting and Living Together, co-organized by UNESCO, IFAP and the Government of Quebec, 
with the support of the Canadian government. The resulting Quebec call for action adopted by the General Conference last uh, session called all stakeholders, the international community, to take multidimensional action to combat violent extremism by supporting policy relevant research on linkages between youth, internet and radicalization, de-radicalization as well as researchers informed policies and action to exercise their rights and engage as active citizens. It was also encouraging uh, all actions to empowering youth online communities and key youth stakeholders on topics relevant to counter radicalization by building their competencies and skills and by equipping them with creative and knowledge, creative tools and knowledge. It called also to strengthening mobilization and cooperation between media professionals to combat radicalization and online hate speeches with a focus on countries suffering tensions and conflict situations. And also to support creative media campaigns and outreach professionals targeting policymakers, online youth communities and opinion makers. As a result, this multidimensional multi action can be observed in a number of initiatives from UNESCO work on media and information literacy, engaging young people to exercise their right and be active citizens in the NetMed project or establishing guidelines to combat online radicalization and use uh, and uh, online radicalization of youth and violence extremism. Further reflection was led uh, in uh, 2017, where UNESCO and IFAP organized an international conference on youth and ICT toward countering violent extremism in cyberspace in Beirut, Lebanon. After this, an expert presentation meeting under the team Darknet, the new societal, legal, technological, and ethical challenges was organized by IFAP and the Knowledge Societies Division in September 2017 in UNESCO to discuss the challenges of cyber threats and ways to improve national strategies through innovative and global solutions in that respect. Others meeting, other meetings followed to present the current effort by the international community, particularly UNESCO and IFAP, in establishing effective measures to prevent online radicalization and stimulate the use of internet for peace, understanding and intercultural dialogue as well as the ethical implications of the darknet. A recent study of UNESCO on youth and violent extremism on social media shows some evidence for correlation between exposure to extremist propaganda and recruitment and the expression of extremist and attitudes and increased risk for violent radicalization among youth, particularly in the case of extreme right-wing groups. However, the exact roles and processes via which internet and social media contribute to the radicalization processes need to be further explored. The IFAP strategic plan does emphasize the priority intervention of raising awareness about these ethical issues, further is the is investigate the use of cyberspace for the radicalization of young people leading to violence. It foresees the creation of a network of institutions working on online radicalization and more awareness on policy options for managing radicalization on the internet. In, in, recogni in recognition of the transboundary nature of the internet, IFAP will keep on supporting regional and international cooperation, capacity building research, the exchange of good practices 
and development of broad understanding and capabilities to respond to these ethical challenges. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Madam Haddad, uh, uh, for this overview of FIFAP engagement uh, with the international community to cooperate and strengthen efforts to prevent uh, youth radicalization uh, worldwide. Uh, this is a very ex important work that has been achieved uh, thanks to your personal involvement, for, for which, again, we express our deep appreciation. Now, uh, we have two speakers who will uh, speak and provide a youth perspective on questioning the narratives and ideas on which extremist groups are founded through the development of consistent counter-narratives and through education on information and communication technologies. It is my pleasure now to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Bivina Fraumeix, uh, who is a professor in media sociology and the director of a master's program in e-learning and media education engineering at the Université Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris. She is uh, also a member of the European Commission's high-level expert group on fake news and online misinformation. Bivina, please. Thank you, Boyan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry for the change in the program. I will have to leave just before four to go and fetch students of mine from Sorbonne Nouvelle who, who want to attend uh, the uh, IGF at UNESCO. So apologies in advance if you see me rush out. It's not that I don't like you, it's that I like my students too, <laughs> so if I may say so. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mrs. Adad, for mentioning the book, um, the research on uh, youth extremism and social media that I did with two of my colleagues, uh, Serafin Alava and uh, Haida Gassan. Um, that uh, for which you, you did some of the, gave some of the results, uh, unconclusive results in fact, and it was a mapping of uh, the state of the art of research uh, dealing with um, <coughs> radicalization, and I think we have to continue doing research. But basically it's true that we did say that um, uh, internet, uh, social media, uh, were a facilitating environment, but were not the causal reason for radicalization and that a lot of the offline world uh, and the interaction between the different media, mass media and social media had to be taken into account. So cautious uh, as usual with uh, research and I, I do hope we continue with UNESCO um, putting research and evidence-based policy uh, forward which is something that uh, we've, uh, we've always tried to do even though it's uh, difficult and painful sometimes. Um, but uh, it's one of the reasons um, uh, UNESCO always provides an ethical um, boussole is a word I'm looking for in English, uh, an ethical um, GPS, if you want, uh, on, on these issues um, that are, are burning hot and that are part of a whole cluster, in my opinion, that I call information disorders in the plural. Uh, because uh, there's radicalization, there's disinformation, there's propaganda, um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, manipulation. But I would like to emphasize more the, the solution side of uh, the research and of uh, education. And so I'll be speaking mostly from the perspective of my UNESCO chair, which is called Savoir Devenir, um, Becoming, as I said this morning in the other session, uh, just like the title of Michelle Obama's book. Uh, but um, this idea that you have to uh, train young people who've been born with the internet um, to master it um, and not just uh, be there in a sort of in the wild um, uh, and learn to become uh, and to grow and to project themselves into, the, into their own uh, future. Um, and uh, with the chair there is also an association that we created also called Savoir Devenir that um, uh, engages uh, in um, the um, transmission of digital uh, uh, media literacy. Uh, so this is what uh, I, I would like to insist uh, upon, is how to go uh, about media and information literacy, how to ensure that media and information literacy is the counter-narrative among all the others, but is the one that is the most uh, holistic, the one that uh, can uh, accompany young people from uh, very early stages at school and throughout uh, their, their maturity uh, instead of other cases uh, of solutions that are uh, dedicated to a certain age group that are one shot uh, which is what we see mostly in the research. 
uh, nice initiatives, uh, projects that may last one, two, at best three years, and then we have a, a, a very hard time uh, ensuring that they continue and that they enlarge at the national level. And so it's a lot of money in these projects, a lot of energy, a lot of knowledge, a lot of people's uh, best uh, intentions and best practices and best pedagogies. And my feeling uh, as, a, as a researcher in media and information literacy is that uh, uh, the effect is, is a very small trickle-down effect at a moment when all of us feel that there's an emergency in mastering uh, the internet uh, and being very careful not to take uh, measures that are going to censor it uh, or uh, restrain it while at the same time ensuring that some of the values that we all carry here are also embraced by, by the internet, especially in terms of respect of human, of human uh, humankind. So um, that's why um, uh, at Savoir Devenir, we, we really try to push the competence perspective, which is often forgotten by uh, good practices. Uh, and practitioners are on the field, they want to solve one issue that they identify, and they don't see that they could be part of the larger picture uh, uh, that we're trying to build as uh, researchers and, and practitioners of male uh, that um, engages competences. And uh, as I always say, you have to see the competences as a butterfly, a butterfly with four wings. Uh, one which is skills, knowing how to use the internet for sure. Uh, another one which is about attitudes and especially respect and self-respect and tolerance to others and to ambiguity, and to other cultures. Um, and then there is knowledge because you have to build a certain amount of knowledge about the internet and we are sorely missing about the economics of the internet, about the uh, dark net, uh, and without knowledge, we take decisions that are blind or can be rash. Uh, so it's about critical knowledge also. Um, and the last one is values. And so for the butterfly to fly, it has to have the four wings and not just one or two of them. Uh, and I think uh, it's an appropriate metaphor for us to continue together because it's a smiley metaphor. And that's the other thing I'm trying to push with my colleagues at Savoir Devenir and with UNESCO. We're in discussion at the moment about that, um, about creating in each country a smile center, which is to say uh, a center for the synergies of media and information literacy in each uh, country so that uh, people who have some practices, who want to go beyond, uh, who want to network with other smile centers uh, around the world, um, can, uh, can do it because we think that um, getting the support of outsiders is sometimes one of the best ways to avoid being caught in one's own country's toxic state, which is what propaganda and what radicalization does. Um, it creates an atmosphere of polarization of people, of impossibility of having a dialogue that doesn't end up uh, in a bloodbath, um, be it a verbal bloodbath or a physical one. Um, and so I think this is one of the interests uh, of places like UNESCO where we can exchange that and say, well, you know, sometimes getting out of the box of your own country, of your own situation can be helpful, but how do you create situations like that? You can do it also online and you can have a network of these uh, uh, smile centers that interacts online, exchanges resources, uh, looks for more ways of strategizing. And so this smile center obviously has to be multi-stakeholder. There certainly is a way where you can negotiate with uh, uh, the private sector, the public sector, uh, NGOs, etc. Because one of my concerns as a male researcher at the moment uh, is that uh, uh, independent research about these issues is uh, rarer and rarer. It's a lot of it is sponsored by the GAFAMs, um, and you can see how they want to participate, but you can see how this can put some suspicion on uh, the, the, the independence uh, of a research that is being funded by the very social media that are being incriminated. And so there has to be some kind of means of neutralizing the, 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 the origin of uh, the, the help to research so that uh, it can proceed independently. And this can only be done with the help of public governments, uh, with uh, universities, academia, etc. So the Smile Center has academia in it, has the private sector, has the public sector, and ensures um, that uh, there is a um, uh, positive synergies and independence uh, in the funding and the results, as, uh, uh, of course. So this is um, 
I think something I'd like to, to share with you. The last thing I want to mention is that um, um, we, for mill, we can also repurpose, and it's one of the things that for me is going to help scaling up mill, uh, scaling up the training of teachers, uh, scaling up the training of NGO uh, people who want to uh, um, go into mill, etc. And uh, one, of the, one way of scaling up is using some of the research tools, some of the private sector tools that are out there and trying to see how they can be uh, modified uh, or augmented uh, to go towards the, the male community in the schools and outside the schools. So at the moment, you should know that with UNESCO, we're doing a hackathon on uh, combating uh, uh, information disorders and acting against, uh, trying to understand solutions uh, to act against. And we're using two already existing tools. One that is emerging from research, uh, which is a, um, an, um, a plugin that's called INVID, that allows you to do forensics on fake news and figure out fake videos and etc. And another one uh, that is a platform called Seriously um, that uh, helps people develop strategies for debate, talking to the others without fighting, etc. And we are dis discussing during this hackathon that is taking place at Sorbonne Nouvelle, uh, um, but with Isaac as partner and uh, Renaissance Numérique as partner, we're discussing with young people the way to put these tools already existing, lots of money in this, um, into uh, the schools and also directly on computers for young people, teachers, parents to use, uh, but making it easier of, of access and, and of use. And so uh, for me, this is what MIL is about. Um, it's about um, uh, sharing, uh, it's about caring, it's about um, building resilience uh, among young people from very early, uh, and you should see young people who are five, six or seven, how they swallow this kind of thing and, and get into it with a lot of uh, pleasure. And uh, this is a message I want to leave with you. It's this message of um, a beautiful but butterfly that is the butterfly of all our young people uh, using um, competences that um, uh, actually really empower them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Divina. I'm always very pleased to listen to you. We, we work uh, on these issues for quite a long time now. A long and very productive cooperation, and uh, it's always a pleasure to note the progress achieved by you and your team on all these important issues. Uh, the only concern I may say I had when you described the competencies as a butterfly knowing that the life expectation of a butterfly is from three days to four weeks, the maximum. I just hope that our competencies that we are building will last longer. But uh, this, of course, is uh, just for you the metaphor that you used in your presentation. So now, thank you again. We will move to our next speaker, uh, is Mr. Mark Hecker. He is a director at the French Institute for International Relations and editor-in-chief of uh, the magazine Politique uh, Etrangère. I must say that I saw the last uh, uh, number of uh, Politique Etrangère devoted to the internet and uh, issues at stake in the cyberspace. Congratulations, extremely interesting. Uh, myself learned a lot. A PhD in political science from the University of Paris 1 Pantheon Sorbonne. He teaches a course on terrorism and asymmetric warfare at Sciences Po author of several books, including Intifada Francaise and War 2.0, Irregular Warfare in the Information Age. Marc uh, will provide some case studies on profiles of individuals sentenced in France for cases related to jihadism and some ideas on which extremist groups are founded. So Marc, please. Thank you, Boyan. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm going to present this uh, study. It's called 137 Shades of Terrorism, French Jihadists Before the Courts. You can find it online on IFRI's website. Uh, so IFRI is the Institut Français des Relations Internationales. Uh, of course, I'm not going to present the whole study now because I only have 10 minutes. So I'm going to focus uh, on the web aspects of this study. And I have to say as an introduction that uh, the radicalization processes that I study often are a mix of online and offline interaction. And we, 
Of course, this conference is uh, on the internet, on the web, but we should not forget the offline side because uh, offline uh, aspects are always uh, very important in radicalization processes too. Uh, that being said, I'm, I've tried to identify different ways in which the terrorists that I studied and who are convicted by French courts over the past years use uh, the internet. And I singled out four different ways uh, they use the web. First, the internet is quite often used as a library, a radical library uh, by those terrorists. It's still easy today, even though it's true that uh, the main platforms have tried to get rid of a lot of uh, radical contents, but still it is uh, easy today to find radical content online, and you do not even have to go to the dark net to find this content. You can even find this content on websites that are really easily uh, accessible. Uh, so you can find uh, the full web magazines, for instance, produced by ISIS. Uh, you can find videos, you can find audios, you can find radical images, you can find handbooks, doctrines. Uh, so the, the terrorists that I studied used the internet uh, as a radical library. The second use of the internet that I singled out is uh, a recruitment tool. So social media in particular are used by terrorist groups to try and find new recruits. And in my study, for instance, uh, there was a, a man, uh, a recruiter, who tried to hook young people on social media and once he had hooked them online, then we passed to the offline interaction and they set up meetings uh, in real life in different cities of, the, of France. And uh, this recruiter managed to uh, recruit at least three uh, young people. And first, uh, he had met them online. Then the third use uh, of the internet, the third way uh, terrorists use the web is uh, as a communication tool. Uh, so once terrorist groups are constituted, the internet serves as a way for terrorists to interact. And it's quite surprising, you really have terrorists today who are not aware of the level of surveillance of the internet and who keep on discussing quite openly uh, their projects and, well, they end up in front of courts because they are caught by the authorities, uh, but it's still surprising that today some of the terrorists are not aware of uh, the surveillance. But on the other hand, you also have terrorists who are aware of the surveillance and who use different techniques to try and uh, avoid uh, being detected by the police or the intelligence agencies. And among these techniques, uh, they use encryption, they use uh, anonymous email addresses and leave their message in the draft section. They fragment also their conversation between different platforms and quite often it's platforms that are not well known by the public. We're not speaking here about Facebook, Twitter or even Telegram. We're speaking about much smaller platforms uh, that are not necessarily American or European platforms. And uh, they discuss then quite openly uh, about their project, but here they are quite protected uh, by these different measures that they take to uh, avoid being detected. Then there's a fourth use of the internet that I uh, managed to single out, and it's uh, used to try and plan attacks. And here uh, you have different platforms that are used. Google Earth, for instance, can be used to uh, try and have a, a broad view of an area where a specific terrorist attack can take place. Or I just give you a precise example that I had in my sample. Uh, there was a, a terrorist convicted in France who had Googled over a three months period more than 800 times uh, how to prepare bombs or how to make an attack. And uh, again, this guy was, this man was, was caught by the police and by the domestic intelligence agency. But the fact is that uh, you have terrorists who still use Google or YouTube to try and find tutorials or videos uh, on uh, how to uh, prepare and make an attack. So 
Once we've said that, uh, what can be done to try and counter those four different uses of the internet by terrorists? And here uh, I have to say, and that's not in my study, that's more linked to a previous study that I did in, in 2015, and uh, this one was only in French, so I won't quote the title, but you can find it on, on IFRI's website too. And here you can single out three different methods that have been used over the past years to try and counter the use of the internet by terrorists. The first one, of course, is law enforcement work. Uh, it is important. The online actions of terrorists can be monitored, they can be tracked, proofs can be gathered, and if you go to court to attend trials, you will see that quite often the proofs that are used to condemn uh, the individuals were found online. Uh, I just give you one example. I attended a trial last year in Paris. It was about a group who joined a jihadist group in Syria, and the leader of the group uh, said that he wanted to go there to do humanitarian work, uh, but then the prosecutor said, well, but if we look at the internet record of the individual, we can see that he was not consulting uh, the websites of humanitarian organization, but he was consulting the websites of terrorist organization, and uh, he ended up joining terrorist organization and the whole group was convicted to several years in jail. A uh, second method used to counter the use of the internet by terrorists is counter-messaging. A good and efficient uh, counter-narrative is composed of three different things. Uh, first, a good message, then a good messenger, and then a good platform. A good message is not easy to tailor. If you take the example of France versus ISIS, uh, the main messages that were sent uh, were about first, uh, we tried to explain that, or the French government tried to explain that ISIS presents a utopian vision of the caliphate, whereas life in Syria is very harsh. Then second, second message, uh, it was about exposing the atrocities done by ISIS and to show that the rhetoric used by the group about justice was just a lie. And then a third big message was to insist on ISIS military setbacks that contradict the propaganda of the organization about the expansion of the group. Uh, but I think that there were some elements missing in this counter messaging and especially uh, the religious side uh, that was deliberately avoided by the government. So of course, uh, this leads to the question of the messenger. Uh, you will quite often hear people say that public authorities, governments, are not the best messengers because their production will immediately be discredited as uh, state propaganda. I have to say that I disagree with that. I think there's a space also for governments in counter messaging. Uh, I think it's very useful, depending on the target audience, of course, but to have messages coming from governments especially towards families of people who are getting radicalized to show that they can receive help uh, from public authorities. But it's correct to say that most of the counter messaging and most of the counter narratives have to come from the civil society. And over the past years, a lot of projects have already been developed by different organizations at different level. Uh, it's true uh, for international organizations, but also for very local organizations. Some of these initiatives are very broad counter-narratives initiatives that do not target a specific audience. And then you have much more targeted initiatives uh, towards vulnerable populations, a specific area, a specific neighborhood, for instance. And you even have one-to-one -one attempts to try and disengage people who are already in terrorist groups and uh, who are challenged online by former radicals who try to help them disengage. So for instance, there was a very interesting project uh, launched and led by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London that was based on the, this one-to-one -one, uh, method and they hired former far-right extremists and former jihadists to try and challenge uh, actual and current uh, radicals online. Tech companies are also involved in counter-narrative initiatives, but usually they do not, do not produce the counter-narrative themselves. 
they help civil society produce and boost their own uh, counter-narrative initiatives. Uh, for instance, you may be aware of the redirect method by Google or uh, by the uh, initiatives taken by Facebook to try and boost some of the posts created by uh, NGOs or civil society associations. But uh, I have to say that a few years ago, when you asked the GAFAMs uh, what they were doing against uh, extremism, they always mentioned uh, counter-narratives, and that was not enough. So a lot of pressure was put on, on these big companies to do more, and especially they were asked to delete more and more content, so they received really a lot of pressures from different governments and international organizations. There were laws taken in several countries, for instance in Germany, to try and compel uh, the big companies to do more. And the fact is that they did more. Uh, so now they use new technology, for instance AI, artificial intelligence technology, to remove automatically hundreds of thousands of contents. Uh, it's true for Twitter and more and more also for uh, Facebook and, and Google. And it's become harder uh, for terrorists, but also for researchers and journalists to find uh, this content online. So in a way, it seems to be pretty efficient. It's not impossible to find the content, but it's much harder. To make it clear, I think it's impossible to get rid of extremist contents online, but it is possible to make it much harder for extremist organization to reach a broad audience. Now I come to my conclusion, and for my conclusion I have a bad news, a good news, and a dilemma. The bad news is that online radicalization is not a myth, uh, even though the internet is often only part of the process, we always have to uh, have a look online but also offline again. The good news is that several ways have been used and several methods have been used to try and prevent online radicalization and some of them seem to be quite efficient and the dilemma can be summed up by one question and this question is how can we find the right balance between safety or security on the one hand and the protection of civil liberties on the other hand and I think that UNESCO and this panel is probably the right place to discuss this hard question. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the good news and uh, also for the bad news. And for the dilemma, of course, we are working on these issues, I must say, uh, for quite a long time now. UNESCO organized the first Info Ethics Congress dealing with very similar issues in 1995. It was organized in Monaco, and this is to say how challenging is the issue since it is on our table even today. Uh, if you allow me, uh, we were planning to have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations, but since Divina is about to leave us, I would like to open the floor for those who would like to address specifically Divina with some questions before uh, she quits the panel, so please, if you have any questions, now it's the time to ask her about what uh, uh, she presented to you. Okay, I see that you have been extremely clear. Uh, okay, please go ahead. Please introduce yourself. And uh, hello everyone, my name is Emanuela and I'm a Isaac Fellow and I'm from Brazil, and what I want to ask about this kind of project, and uh, specifically, is how do you do when there is a parallel power that is greatly strong, and you have communities that are too difficult to reach because of this, because you have something that is working parallel to the government, for instance, and you can't just enter there. Like, what do you propose about, about this? Thank you. Okay, that's an interesting uh, question. I must say, I haven't thought about it that way. Are you alluding to um, paramilitary forces uh, or? Uh uh, it can be, specifically in the case of Brazil, for instance, we have in favelas, sometimes we have communities that, that are really closed mm -hmm. and it's difficult for even NGOs to enter there. So how do you do this job? How do you talk in a place where you have a parallel power? 
Right. Well, it happens in many places. So it's true that you have to uh, work with the local people and, and create an environment of trust. Uh, that's why we often, in our sessions, when we do training, we do a training of uh, trainers, but we use the young people who are trained as our ambassadors. And uh, it's uh, the second level, the second tier of training, if you want, that they, they can go back to their communities and start working with them at that level, with, with young people as, uh, as ambassadors. Uh, it puts them sometimes in a difficult position, but we also give them tools and to go back and forth and to, to negotiate. And, and, um, and that's where we, I think that media literacy is a, a good tool to help you have a dialogue um, with people who are, uh, have difficulty with tolerating other discourse, uh, uh, creating tools to, to counter-argue, to bring uh, other elements. Um, uh, and but not to deny the presence of the other, because that's often, unfortunately, when you go in thinking you have the right response, um, this is not going to work. Eh? You, you have to reach a, a kind of a, a understanding together. And uh, I think strongly we need more and more to engage people, young people themselves in that, and to tell their parents you know, that they're not buying this anymore and that they don't want to stay in that, just in that environment. And uh, ICT tools can help there. So, um, and it's interesting that you mentioned the Monaco youth meeting uh, because that was one of the first times we got young people to speak. And one of the things they were saying, they were saying, adults don't listen to us. We, they, they tell us we have a voice, but they don't listen. So what's the point of having a voice if it falls into a void, you know, if there's no response back? And I think these kids who are in these parallel uh, sides and often controlled by adults, huh, is people whose voice was not listened to. And that's why they disenfranchise. So it's about voice and it's about listening. Today, the internet is a lot about chatting out and very few people answering back. And I think when you're media literate, you know to do both. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Nicoletta Lidaki Sivandiri. I'm legal advisor and content analyst at the French Hotline. Uh, we receive reports of terrorist content uh, every day, and I see uh, that uh, the content uh, is uh, radical. As you said, it can be recruitment tool for terrorists and communication tool for terrorists. Uh, the first category is easy to assess because the content can be very violent, beheadings, um, uh, war messages, etc. Uh, the third category is a bit more complicated to assess because terrorists can use internet to promote their life. Uh, many times we see children smiling or uh, participating in, uh, in, in, in an event where they are happy and they play, or it can be even food, what they eat. So what makes it terrorist is the flag, who signs the content, who produces the content. Uh, so my question is, uh, even if we work in the framework of the law and in cooperation with the police, if uh, the definition of terrorist content is uh, clear enough, because from my perspective, some, some, sometimes it's not what we see, but who signs it. Uh, as a result, what is considered terrorist for France or for, for Greece, which is my home country, is not terrorist for, for another country. Thank you very much. Well, we will just take one more minute. If any, uh, do you want to? Do you know? Ah, so okay. Mark, you can go ahead. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, of course, there's no uh, uh, there's no consensual definition of terrorism. Uh, we've been searching uh, for this definition for years, and there's a, a Swiss scholar, Alex Schmidt who analyzed more than a hundred definitions of terrorism and who tried to uh, produce a so-called consensual academic definition of terrorism and it's a very long definition, uh, several pages. So perhaps it's not very operational. 
Uh, you may be aware that uh, Facebook uh, published a definition a few months ago, and it's very short, so it was very surprising to see this definition. And actually the problem is that it's so broad that you could include almost any group that resorts to violence. Uh, so you're right, uh, for the moment, it's more the group uh, that, uh, impor that, that's important than uh, really the message. And for a, most of the platforms uh, used by the, uh, uh, the big companies like Facebook, Google, etc., cetera, uh, even a, a cookbook produced by ISIS uh, would be something that they wouldn't want on their platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I think it's pretty clear for the different states what's legal or not legal. Uh, but with regard to the internet, it's much more complicated. And so the big platforms say, well, we have our own standards uh, and you have to abide by these standards. And if you produce violent contents, whether you're uh, a far-right activist, a uh, left-wing activist, an ecologist, uh, uh, an Islamist or whatever, if you produce violent content and if you promote hate, then you will not be allowed to be on our platform. Uh, whether you produce then violent content or other types of content. You will not be allowed to have a page, for instance, or a group. Thank you. Now, we move now to our last two speakers. First will be Mrs. Lilian Nalwoga, who will provide examples of policies and action plans in Africa to address the prevention of radicalization. I want to introduce her briefly. I like the way it is put in her CV, a technology enthusiast. So uh, welcome uh, to our panel. We, I hope we all have in the room technology enthusiasts. Uh, she has 10 years of internet policy research and implementing IST for development projects, coordinator of the Uganda and East African Internet Governance Forums. She has served also on the UN Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group on the Global Internet Governance Forum from 2012 to 2014, and currently she is the president of the Internet Society Uganda chapter and program manager at the collaboration on international ICT policy in East and Southern Africa. Lillian, it's a pleasure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bernard. Um, well, by the virtue of fact that we are all here, I guess we are all technology enthusiasts. Um, my intervention is, um, one is uh, in Africa, we do um, realize the value that the internet offers in terms of economic, political benefits. But at the same time, we are seeing a trend of um, using uh, the internet and uh, particularly social media as platforms for promoting terrorism through recruiting uh, um, young, young people, women and uh, the sorts. We've seen um, three main uh, uh, terrorist uh, groups, Al-Shabaab, mainly from East Africa, uh, Kenya, Uganda, where I'm, I'm, I'm from Uganda, and um, we've had um, terror attacks before. Uh, so is Kenya, and uh, we all know what happened in West Africa, what's happening in uh, Nigeria with the Boko Haram, and I still having ties to some, uh, I think, to Boko Haram. So, what are African governments doing? At the moment, um, there really are few countries within Africa that really have national strategies. And um, what is probably happening is there's a current struggle between providing platforms or providing legislations that are promoting responsible use of the internet at the same time trying to strike a balance between protecting or upholding um, internet rights, uh, freedom of expression. So at the moment what we have um, anti-terrorism laws which no not, do not necessarily provide for online um, radicalism or handling online radicalization or um, fighting terrorism online. Uh, just so to give um, to give an example is many of the internet users in Africa and probably the youth are using social media as social media platforms as the main tools of engagement. And to many, 
coming onto the internet, um, they're first experiencing use of the internet through social media. So then social media becomes the biggest platform for them to, you know, to experience that use of the internet. The only challenge right now is how to strike a balance through that. Of course, there are lots of things, anything that you see probably on, on social media turns out to be true to many. It may seem true. And uh, what is happening is um, terrorists or uh, radicalists are using this as a tool to appeal, to get that emotional appeal, to tap into that and be able to, you know, capture this. Um, in terms of, say, strategies, they are currently, as far as I'm concerned, three countries uh, that do have um, strategies on preventing uh, radicalization online, and that is Somalia, Kenya, and Nigeria. Um, for other countries, Uganda, for instance, uh, Cameroon, Chad, what is in place are, like I said before, national um, terrorism laws and with small components of criminalizing use of social media for spreading terrorism. Um, for Uganda in particular, the anti-terrorism law was amended um, in 2016 to capture for using online platforms to disseminate content that promotes terrorism. Now, here is the catch that it has a broader criminalization of what is called, you know, um, what terrorism or involvement of, of terrorist uh, activities. There's a particular clause that has unful, unlawful possession of materials or promoting terrorism, such as audio, video tapes, and all that. The challenge here is how do you define the defining the definition of terrorism in the context of many, it may be a little bit hard, and I think the lady from, I, th I don't know, Brazil or Spain mentioned, how do you draw a, a distinction between that? I'll give an example. Without a clear strategy, then these anti-terrorism laws that are currently in some of the countries become open to abuse. Um, in 2016, uh, in my country, we, we had, we've had two cases where the anti-terrorism law has been used to criminalize and arrest people who are actually expressing themselves legitimate concerns, but which concerns all are being seen as government or being critical and in this case may lead to, you know, promoting, you know, terrorism and that sort of thing. Um, a particular case was we had uh, an attack on one of the, we have uh, so many kingdoms in my country, so somewhere in, West, in uh, Western Uganda, there was um, a violence that broke out at one of the regional uh, palaces. And uh, there was this journalist, she had gone home visiting and she filmed this. When she filmed this, she posted it on, face, on, on, a, on a Facebook account and uh, when, um, when the, the, the law enforcement saw this, they arrested her and charged her, you know, for abetting terrorism. Because what? She was circulating graphic photos that were, you know, um, promoting, you know, fighting and all that. Um, what, to make it interesting is that in this particular region, there's been a, there's been a bit of fighting. So when you get instances like that without clear strategies on how to promote some rights on freedom of expression, recording and all that, vis-a-vis -vis promoting um, terrorism. So that is one of the other biggest challenges. And we've also seen in instances where it usually comes to uh, journalists where they are kind of caught in touch uh, in tight positions where if they say they are filming um, riots or protests and uh, there is some bit of conflict between a neighboring country. The most rec recent case we saw 
an article that appeared in the papers where these uh, journalists were reporting tensions between Uganda and neighboring Rwanda. And in this case, they were arrested because they were seen to be promoting some sort of, you know, radicalization, you know, extremism, promoting hate online that would lead to probably having these sort of uh, conversations. And we are seeing also issues of, you know, number of um, regulations coming up on preventing um, uh, fighting fake news, hate speech, and that sort of thing. But in the end, when the actual arrests that are happening are actually of people who are actually expressing themselves or people who are actually critical of government, but then the government is using this as a tool to you know, further criminalize their free speech. So in the absence of actual concrete strategies, how do we go on addressing? One is there's the issue, of course, there are legitimate concerns that uh, young, young people are being recruited into you know, uh, terrorist activities. Of course, we've seen cases, we've seen so many arrests in, in Uganda, but also there's that issue of how do you draw that balance between saying that this is legitimate and this is not legitimate. So, um, and I think uh, we heard from Devina the issue of media literacy comes into play, but from my perspective, it's not just for the youth, I think. It's also for the governments to understand how one to first empower themselves to understand the actual benefits or the actual mechanisms that not all speech online is radical speech. That is one thing. But also for the youth who are just getting onto line through social media, how do you then use this as platforms for actual engagement into actual developmental uh, initiatives rather than just clicking on anything that you're seeing? So um, from my perspective, this is why I'm seeing this is what is happening in, in, um, in Africa. Uh, I know I was supposed to talk about current policies and action plans. They are there, just three countries have actual plans on that, and most of them are initial stages in regard to the online activity for preventing um, radicalization online. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lillian. It's a uh, serious perspective to, to reach a situation where all countries are working on it. Uh, needs are huge, and uh, uh, we have to make sure that awareness is raised because the solution, again, will be political. The solution will not be technological, obviously, but uh, the political will, will uh, or not make things to change and advance. Our last speaker today will be Mr. Sadan Jebali. Welcome to the panel, who graduated from the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. And uh, after pursuing public policy master's program, he also worked as a journalist uh, and development consultant on the Middle East and North Africa issues with a special focus on civil society government relationship. Sadem co-founded Intric8, a think tank and a consultancy firm aiming to develop research and projects in Tunisia. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I think it's resuming a bit. And um, actually, like, I will be giving more perspective from um, a practitioner and from as well the different projects I have been working on on countering violent extremism. Um, so I'm coming from just to give a bit more uh, context. So I'm coming from civil society. I have been working civil society before the revolution and after. Um, and I had a different perspective of civil society from an NGO, uh, then to an international organization, um, and then an international organization working on countering violent extremism, and in particular working on alternative narratives, uh, development, and supporting for NGOs. Uh, and at the end as well, uh, I left the international organization and I started working um, form with people that have been working in the think tank 
on supporting NGOs and supporting government, but being independent, not under the umbrella of an international organization. Uh, so I will, I'm, I'm briefly describing this because this is just giving some background uh, for what I will be speaking on um, uh, in the later stage. Um, so I'm talking about a, context, a contextual situation which is proper to Tunisia, but this is uh, nonetheless can give as well other, um, other insights on what's happening in the MENA region or even um, in the African continent. Um, so recently, um, on the fifth point of the Quebec call uh, for, act for action, so the fifth point which is urging the government to engage and empower youth uh, to lead new digital projects that foster peace, tolerance, and mutual understanding, I picked a, a special example of, um, of digital platforms that are promoting alternative uh, narratives in Tunisia. Uh, I picked three of them. One is called Youth More, uh, the other one is called Haya, and the last one is called AKT, which is Alakhat Rekunsi, because you are Tunisian. Uh, those three are three concrete case studies of civil society organizations developing an alternative narrative to countering violent extremism. Uh, I picked those three because the three of them, they have a strong digital presence, and I have been looking at the three of them, uh, whether from an outsider, as like following how those three platforms are concretely engaging with young people who are vulnerable uh, to violent extremism, or one of those three as well I was contributing in building. Um, so, and those three experiences, comparative experiences, of actual civil society engagement to counter violent extremism, um, for the last, those were lasting for the last three years, and they are still continuing to work now. Um, so what, what kind of lessons, I wanted to share concrete lessons of those three experiences. Um, and as well, um, some sort of recommendation and comments. Uh, so civil society organization is like, there was like a rush in, on civil society organization to engage on countering violent extremism because, especially in the Tunisian government, uh, the government, uh, like especially in countries after a long time of dictatorship, they don't, they are not able to, to have a credible image if they engage on, uh, on a strategic communication or counter narrative. So there was a need to go and work rather with civil society organization to develop this alternative narratives. And they were aware that uh, as well from the international uh, organization experience, uh, they cannot support direct government intervention because this might look less propaganda. So uh, it was quite a tricky and interesting relationship and here speaking about the power balance between a government who is willing to do something because they know that uh, Tunisia is one of the countries that has exported the biggest number of foreign fighters to Syria and at the same time a vibrant civil society that is as well trying to counterbalance the, the uh, and to try to make its place in, uh, in the country. So it was interesting to see how those two spheres uh, who were like a bit contradictory trying to come up together, uh, for example, to work on this counter narrative experiences. Uh, what I have noticed through this uh, is like in Tunisia there was the implementation of the counter narrative strategy. So there is as well a policy like my colleague was speaking about um, Uganda. So it's like there is a policy. And then there was even an initiative to build an alternative narrative platform. So a governmental body that will be um, trying to develop communication campaigns, but with civil society organization. So it was interesting to see that the government is taking a bit step forward uh, in trying to get into this field. Um, but as well, it's like out of those experiences, there was some clashes between the civil society organizations who were not really keen to work with the government, others who were keen to work with the government because there was international funding, just like as well giving them some funding in order to sustain their activities. Uh, so it's like all this, all this kind of ecosystem that started to emerge um, is still interesting to, uh, to be studied. I think in the next couple of years we'll be able to draw a clear uh, reports, but like what I will be doing now, so it's like I, um, I wanted to share some of the main challenges and opportunities uh, about those experiences. So for the challenges, I see it more like uh, from two parts, from the strategic and the operational part. Uh, from the strategic part, it's like, especially it's the sustainability of such platform. Uh, those NGOs, concretely speaking, they have Facebook pages and like they go up to 300,000 members in those pages. And what they are trying to do is like 
they are trying to target young people who are vulnerable in different areas uh, in the country. But there is still the problem of like sustainability because it's like the, this kind of hybrid status between an NGO and having only an online presence is not really fitting with the agenda of like the different international donors. And as a model, it's not really sustainable. So there is still this big challenge of how such platform can sustain, sustain themselves beyond the agenda of uh, countering narrative. And by countering narrative here, concretely speaking, the three of them, they are focusing on alternative narrative pathways. So stories about young people who are from those regions who were able to demonstrate resilience. Uh, so just to pick, so someone who is like from one of the neighborhoods where there is the highest, the highest rate of, uh, of, pe of young people who went to Syria in Tunisia, who, who became like, who was practicing boxing and then he opened like a, um, um, a boxing as well club for the young people from that, those areas. And he started like recruiting as well those young people within uh, using sports as a mean to, uh, to, to empower them. So it's like promoting such stories is as well giving another uh, like view about the neighborhood and about the potential of young people there. Um, within the challenges, uh, there is a lack of as well of systema systemized approach for multi-stakeholders initiatives. The government and civil society, they are, they are trying to work together, but still the media, for example, the mainstream media is a bit uh, marginalized, so it can work, it can play a big role in that in this kind of uh, initiatives um, because it's not only about the digital space but mainstream media can as well play a role to target the wider audience. Uh, the third point on the strategic as well uh, challenges, uh, a challenge is about the, like maybe, okay, maybe this might not be as clear but like there is, w w while working on this, I have seen there is like a bit the, I call it the development versus security mindset on the question. So you have the development mindset, which is more about how can we develop things on the longer term, and you have the secu security mindset, and you would find this especially in the government, um, where it's like, what kind of action can we do now uh, to stop uh, violent extremism and to stop the recruitment of, uh, of terrorists? So I think this is as well sort of dilemma that, uh, that is still, uh, still present. Uh, on the operational side now for the challenges, I think as well uh, there is a need to monitor the new tactics, tactics of uh, violent extremist groups recruitment uh, because m while most of the research are about things that were happening in the last two or three years, things are changing quite fast and there is a need to have like um, a, a monitoring of how is the recruitment made now that, um, that like how terrorist groups are act, uh, active now as I, um, ISIS, like, as, as an entity, is almost vanishing from the real sphere. Uh, the other operational part is the high cost of production and distribution of communication materials when it comes to campaigning. And this is not like possible for all uh, NGOs or all actors to, uh, to, to, like, to pay this high cost. Um, and the last point for the operational as well challenges is the high cost of quantitative research and difficult access to tar target audience. It's good to have the best campaign ever, but if you are doing the best campaign ever for the urban, uh, like middle, upper middle class people, this is useless because this is not reaching. Because so the materials, maybe it's like materials should be appealing to the vulnerable youth that we are talking about, to those who are feeling the push and pull factors of radicalization. And in order to do that, you need to have like concrete research and concrete targeting and segmentation. And this kind of concrete quantitative research costs a lot. Um, so I think this is one of the things that as well, if we have a systemized approach of different international actors, the cost can be uh, reduced because each actor will be focusing on an element. Um, now I'll move to opportunities. So it's like, like uh, to stop talking about like two challenges and a lot of problems. Um, I think as well, uh, I wanted to share one of the good practice that we had is like, in engaging with the local communities like rappers and uh, or local communities like online pages that might not be having 100,000 but hundred, having 20,000 or 10,000 uh, followers and being really in that neighborhood, in that localized aspect can, can have way stronger outreach for the alternative narrative messaging that, we, that can be developed. The other element that can as well 
build quite a strong, um, a strong as well engagement is the gender, gender sensitive materials, uh, especially on online spheres. This can, especially that we have seen that during the ISIS like peak of recruitment, most of the social media uh, attraction or narrative was managed by girls and, and women. So it's like, as well, there is some sort of, and this was neglected by most of the projects so far, uh, while uh, there is like uh, an opportunity to engage in that. Um, the third point is like, it's about, uh, we need to think, and I, and I would like to thank as well Divina uh, about this, where, like she mentioned that, it's about like the next generation. Uh, so I think the next generation is um, like, we, we tend to think only about what's the issue now, but if we want to do like a proper counter narrative for the violent extremism, uh, it needs to be working on the younger generation awareness. And I think this is the only sustainable way to avoid what, what we are ha what's happening now. Um, and as well to engage with people and try to have like people from this uh, age group who are part of the, of the work. Because it's not about me or it's about someone who is older than me who is saying we need to engage with the younger generation. We need to have faces who are representative of that. Um, the last two points are about uh, the opportunities are about engaging the private sector. The private sector can play a big role when it comes to uh, to, um, to alternative narrative or or, uh, or countering narratives, because it's like the the, uh, the private sector is where you can find good as well production uh, materials, good production companies, good distribution companies, uh, communication agencies can play a big role um, in this. And I think engaging in CSR or corporate social responsibilities for those companies. In, in the counter narrative can, can be something quite valuable. Um, I have personally tried to do this and it worked with an agency in Tunisia where I approached them and like I explained the value, the societal value of providing some of the experience and some of the tools that they have to NGOs and they have made that and it worked really well. Now with this NGO, they are having a partnership and the NGO was able to leverage funds. So I think NGO and private sector in a CSR out uh, like um, a scheme can play a big role. Um, last thing is changing the uh, mindset within the government regarding countering narrative and towards rather, rather than countering narrative, it's more about alternative narrative. And um, I wanted to share an anecdote about uh, this that I shared with uh, Lillian. Um, at some meeting with some high security officials uh, from the Ministry of Interior, I was trying to convince him that like, the new platform that they are trying to build needs to have like local people from who are some of the local influencer rappers. Um, and this rap, so he's asked about the name and then he taped the name of the rapper and the first song was about like uh, saying like uh, all cops are bastards and all this kind of stuff. So, and then it's like, at first I was a bit, like, I was a bit really hesitating that he might not like this. Uh, he might say that no, like we don't like this kind of profile and then he said like, okay, maybe this is more appealing for the audience. It's not about me, but it's mainly about the audience to whom he can reach out. So he, he accepted and he embraced even more this. So this, I'm saying this anecdote to say that countering narrative can, can be made through the security channels but, and from the NGO channels, but as well can be made by both. But we need just to give it a try and to push for it. So um, this is like uh, the conclusion for my intervention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, before m my concluding remarks, uh, I would like to hear from the audience if there are any questions to our panelists. Okay, please go ahead and uh, indicate to whom you are directing your question. Uh, okay, my question is for Mark. Uh, Mark, I think something really important for us to talk about is like the definition of terrorism, because I'm going to talk about Brazil again, because I'm Brazilian, and we're having a problem there that they want to change the law we have to fight against terrorism, and maybe include social movements, and we have like this really, really big problem there of a historical problem of land distribution. So we have movements who are doing uh, occupations, occupying uh, abandoned buildings, and because they want this this right, the right to this right that they have. But then we have like politics 
getting really strong, really authoritarian, and the possibility of criminalizing these movements and calling it terrorism. So when we talk about privacy, and when we talk about investigating and data privacy, and these groups, I get a little scared, and I would like your personal input about this. <coughs> Before answering, just let's take a few questions so that we know uh, and maybe we can wrap up at the end. I see none, so Mark, go ahead and then I will conclude the panel. Well, I'm not going to, to solve the, the question of the definition because, uh, as I told you, scholars and the international community have tried to define the, the term of terrorism for decades and uh, they never managed really to reach a consensual definition. So I guess it's the role of the civil society to be very careful when governments go too far. Um, but my point was uh, about obvious terrorist groups like ISIS uh, that until recently were not removed from certain platforms because of freedom of expression, freedom of information, and the platform said, well, but we want to allow everyone uh, to uh, have a right to speak. Uh, and, well, I was a bit, you know, shocked by that because uh, I really wondered whether beheadings or people being burned alive or stuff like that, these kind of atrocities, uh, were really an input in some kind of conversation or dialogue. I just thought that there, there are contents that are illegal with obvious terrorist groups and then this content should be not only countered by counter messaging initiative but just removed. Uh, and, uh, then the platform decided to move forward and they came up, at least Facebook, with this very broad definition. And of course, it can be used by authoritarian government. Uh, so we have to be aware uh, about that and to be careful. And when a government or a platform goes too far, I think that here the civil society has a voice to raise. And uh, I think we really can have some clouds in, this day, in these discussions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I would like to thank all our panelists for the extremely interesting presentations. I think that we had a chance to listen from the perspective of an intergovernmental program to the perspective uh, of a policymaker in Africa and also a practitioner in Tunisia with uh, the, the very important input by Mark Eker from IFRI, the think tank. As you can uh, see, the issue is extremely complex and it cannot be addressed separately. We have to fight all kinds of abuses on the internet, all kinds of uh, issues that are making internet and cyberspace an insecure place, especially for young people. And I do believe that it is time after now so many years of discussions to be very practical in the approach and to make sure that we move from the cyber naivety to a cyber security because this is the only way to progress and ensure that this tool that we are all using all the time uh, is uh, uh, helping us uh, to do so in a, in a reliable manner and protecting our rights, uh, protecting our, our privacy and uh, making sure that this is something that uh, yesterday, President Macron mentioned about regulation. I don't know whether we will reach the issue of regulation so quickly. It is taking uh, some time, and we know that very well. It took eight years to prepare a plan of action for the, for the cyberspace. Uh, but uh, I do think we are on the right track. We have to continue this work. Uh, UNSG, uh, Antonio Guterres, yesterday said that we have to be not only multi-stakeholder, but also multidisciplinary. And uh, this panel is a good example of this multidisciplinary. So thank you all again, and uh, good luck for the rest of the IGF. Thank you. Thank you.